I was growing up listening to, you know, Prince and Jimi Hendrix. And then I'm holding this nylon string and I'm like, this is the <laughs> same this thing. <laughs> You're saying this is the same thing. This is how they got those sounds that I'm hearing on those <laughs> records. Okay. If that's what you're saying, you know, in my, you know, five, five-year-old mind, you know, or whatever. And so we go to uh, my Suzuki lesson and down the hall, I hear the sounds echoing of an electric guitar mm. and my eyes just do this. Let me go to that room. <laughs> yeah. And, and my dad, he looked at me, he's like, you want to learn how to play like that? And I just go. <laughs> I'm on fire, gonna bring the heat and play for keys. You're listening to a little bit of our special guest, Michael Gabriel, right here on episode number 102 of the Inner Sleeve Music Podcast. Welcome back to the show. This song is called Let There Be Light. And honestly, I like what I'm hearing, Joe. Listen, Michael Gabriel, no shortage of good songs and definitely no songs that have disappointed me so far. Same here, man. Like, it's just got a good groove, uh, good melodies, uh, and even good mixing. And uh, maybe it's all because of one person only. Well, I think there's a massive major uh, influence when you look at Michael's life and career. Now, Michael, not only a solo artist, but also a touring artist with Sheila E., of course, from Prince and the Revolution, going all the way back with Sheila E., Prince's family. His dad was private security for Prince. So mm -hmm. not only did we hear a lot about Michael's work and career in this episode, Joe, but we also heard a lot about Prince, Sheila E., Paisley Palace, and really the whole world. I mean, this is really an ideal episode for any sort of Prince fan. Yeah, agreed. I'm not, I don't want to, I'm bursting to say a bunch of stuff. But I know. You can get behind, you know. <laughs> Hopping over to some stories in the world of music. They're back. Metallica has announced a brand new record, brand new single, and a brand new world tour. I mean, this is talk about a trifecta. Uh, this is the first tour and album that we're getting from Metallica since 2016's Hardwired to Self-Destruct. And they have no shortage of ideas when it comes to this tour, Joe. This is not just going to be a normal tour from what I understand. Yeah, and like I think the world woke up Monday morning uh, and like, wow, a new Metallica song and video and massive tour coming up. 100%. Well, the tour is going to be featuring two nights in each city that they go to with two different lineups as well for each different night. Now, the no number one lineup, and this varies, I guess, based on where you are in the world. There's certain parts of the world that have Volbeat on the lineup. Uh, but for North America, night one is going to be Metallica opened by Mammoth and Pantera. Yes, you guys heard me right, Pantera. And Mammoth, of course, uh, Wolf Van Halen, which is Eddie Van Halen's son. Uh, so what do you think of night one, Joe? Because just on first glance, I mean, I don't really see what there is. There's nothing to complain about, you know, from my end. I don't think there's anything to complain about, man. I mean, they're doing 46 shows in 22 cities because two two shows per city. Wow. Uh, but like, yeah, me too. I saw that. I'm like, we in Montreal, we're getting the first night is Pantera and the second night is uh, Five Finger Death Punch. Yes, that is for the Canadian and American shows, night two, yeah. uh, Five Finger and then Ice Nine Kills, who I'm not familiar with. Yeah, me but, too. Uh, definitely a big, a big tour for them. I mean, and apparently, yeah, sorry to cut you off, but apparently it's like, even the the sets are not the same every night. So these guys, it's as if they sort of, you know, like I I look at Metallica because growing up, Metallica was like the best band in the world. Like nobody was better than Metallica when I was growing up. You know, it's just it's funny because it looks like over the years, you know, they lost me in terms of a, like you know because I was more of the hardcore stuff, uh, but they gained x of billions of fans, uh, you know, throughout the nineties and two thousands. But it seems like they were getting a bit of flack, you know, like. They tried with Saint Anger. A lot of people were upset with that album, the sound of that album. And then they tried, well, they put out something different with Lulu. Uh, and that totally didn't work out for them. Uh, and then with Hardwired, right, they sort of came back with, oh, no, Death Magnetics, true. They came back with that mm -hmm. sort of heavy, almost Rick unjustice Rubin. for all kind of sound. And this one, man, like, you, when you listen to the song, it's like, uh, I hear right away, like, Kill 'em all vibes and like even Diamond Head, that the early Metallica, the early, early Metallica with an evolution of still sort of new. There's some new aspects to it, right? Yeah, I, I totally agree. You know, it was it was a perfect fusion. And you know, with Kirk Hammett too, is there a more recognizable solo in rock yeah. than Kirk Hammett? Because like the second you hear him go, I'm like, yeah, that's Metallica. Like there's no question, there's no if, yeah. ends, or buts. You know exactly what you're hearing. The only thing I would add is I'm glad he didn't use a Wawa in this one. You right. know, it's always the same. 
this is what I was trying to get at. Like, it seems like Metallica is almost like, if you think of them as a corporation, you know, like a company, they took their audience's viewpoints of like, we want heavier old school stuff. And they sort of like, okay, let's cater to the audience and like give them what they want, but still remaining true to themselves. And like I said before, you know, evolving and, uh, you know, like, uh, still continuing to explore, you know, so you can't fault them for taking chances. Look, and it doesn't always work out for them, but like, I mean, these shows are going to be sold out. And what I'm dreading is like, what are they going to cost? Oh my gosh. I don't even want to know, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I think, and we're going to be touching on this more as today's show goes on, but these ticket companies, you know, they have been out of control in, in more ways than one. So I think the pricing is definitely going to be an issue for this. Uh, you know, in closing, Joe, do you think you're going to see yourself at this event though? Because personally for me, you know, being in one of the cities they're hitting, I don't think I can stay home for two days while this is going on and live <laughs> with myself not being there. I feel the same way. A bit of FOMO, you know, if you're missing out. <laughs> uh, but like at the same time, like it all depends on like I got a family, I got a house, I got you know bills to pay. It's, it's I got to be able to afford it. You know, like I saw Metallica when I was 15. Uh, I skipped school, went to go see the show, and like it was like 20 bucks right back in the day. Wow. Uh, you know, whereas now if it's going to cost me 250 bucks a ticket and up, I don't know, man. That'll be uh, your air breathing fee that Ticketmaster applies, your $20 service fee to yeah. breathe, That uh, mm -hmm. along with the other service fees, it'll be $20. What about you? The reason I really want to be there is because this sounds like fun. You know, like <laughs> when I think of bands going out and touring, I think of cumbersome work. I think of repetition. I think of guys who are sick of playing the same old crap. And this, I think, is going to be the opposite of that. You know, like you're saying, Joe, there's going to be two different sets every night. So, I mean, I think this is hopefully we see more smiles, more enthusiasm. I mean, they're always a band who's, who's done great shows, but hopefully always. this gets them maybe more into it again. Yeah. The other thing that irks me in Montreal is that it's going to be at the big O, which is great in terms of like for spacing, because like I, so, so I'm kind of stuck between wanting to sort of bookend like when i saw metallica you know when i was young and then sort of getting to see this show in the round which is going to be cool because i always like in the round type of shows uh but it's at the big o which is like i've never had a great experience watching a show at the big o so i'm not sure about that you know jumping over to another story concert goers have been struggling to get refunds for a show that just went down in Edmonton, Canada on November 27th. Now, I actually did get the chance to attend this show. The concert was Arcade Fire, supposed to be a headlining concert, a co-headlining gig with Beck. Now, it was announced not long before the show, I think just a month and a half or so uh, before that Beck was not going to be appearing. And the reason he's not appearing was due to allegations that have been continuing on against the singer of Arcade Fire. Now, obviously, you know, it's innocent until proven guilty. But at that same token, a lot of people still wanted to stand by even the accusations, which is, you know, they're right. My question is, though, Joe, do big companies have the sort of duty or, or is it their responsibility to give refunds in a situation like this? I know, like I've, we've seen this happen a few times now, not in the same situation, but just like where the lineup might change and people weren't happy with the lineup and they wanted to get their money back. And, you know, a lot of them have like, you know, if you read the terms and conditions, there's a lot of ticket sales are final kind of thing. And um, but yeah, I, I would just I don't know what to say in this situation. I'd be bummed if I didn't want to go see the show either, but still stuck and couldn't offload the tickets. Yeah. You know, I think the situation is kind of odd, like. I think that if they deserve a refund for anything, it maybe could be for Beck not showing up. But then again, a lot of these tickets, you're, it says rain or shine. Uh, you know, it also says final sale. And it also says set times and artists are subject to change half of the time on these pages. So look, it's like you buy a ticket to a festival too. And I've been in this situation where I go to a festival hoping to see, you know, specific artists. And the day of those artists may not show up, but do you get a refund? No. So I don't know. You know, I think it would be nice to see some, leeway from ticket companies um you know of course Ticketmaster also in hot water over the taylor swift situation that yeah. we've seen yeah these prices are ridiculous uh you know people were paying 20 grand for these tickets because they were stuck right and like the fact that she released uh <laughs> the thing is people like to blame these companies myself included but there is like a big they have to 
there's an agreement, right? A guaranteed, I forgot what it's called. There's a term where it's like guaranteed money that they take every night from each show. There's a certain amount. And then, uh, you know, the promoter, in this case, uh, Live Nation or whoever it may be, has to promote the show, right? All those ads you hear all the time, constantly on the radio, TV, online. There's a lot all of people things. invested in a show. That's it, you know? So I understand from that point of view. So I, I think everybody's sort of guilty a little bit, right? In the whole situation, like the, the artist's, um, demand a certain amount because they got the crew, they got all that stuff to pay. Uh, and then, you know, the promoters are promoting and all that stuff. So they have, you know, they should also, you know, get some money for it and stuff. But I don't know, man, like that's kind of what turns me off a bit about concerts, the prices. And like, you know, if I'd be really upset if the day of all of a sudden the lineups changed, you know, it, it might be a better lineup, right? Than you probably were. But let's say it's like really two, two or three big bands. Like, I'm sure a lot of those people went to go, wanted to go see Beck as much as almost the Arcade Fire, right? Well, most of them seem to have. You know, a lot of people got hotels. A lot of people traveled. And, you know, it, it is one of those situations. I've had that happen to me as well, by the way. There was a rapper I really wanted to see at a festival. And he got replaced last minute with DJ Khaled. And I was like, oh, this is... Oh, Could it get a, any worse? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I know some friends uh, that have driven all the way from Montreal to Boston to see Lenny Kravitz and Pink. And then Lenny Kravitz at the last minute, while everybody's waiting at the door to get in cancels you know? wow and he's and at the time he was known to cancel a lot or often you know but at the same time you know like okay it sucks if you're just like i don't think any artist i mean i, I you know i'll put the benefit of doubt i don't think any artist would see people waiting and and the last minute say i don't feel like it i want to go for dinner or i want to do something else i mean maybe axel rose you know he's been known to do yeah. that kind of stuff, but <laughs> maybe an exception but but I mean, like when you look at some of these artists, like when they do like Metallica, th you know, touring for three years or some of these guys doing all these shows nonstop. I mean, like you do get sick, you get tired, you have to recoup, you know, so it happens, you know, but it just really sucks, especially if you did a lot of traveling. Yeah. Now it's the part of the show where we hop into music suggestions from our listeners. This is, of course, all the comments accumulated throughout the week of suggestions straight from the Sound Mojo comms tab of you guys saying music that we should listen to. And uh it's always a diverse mix. Yes, and it's always uh, AUR who gets the first spot. It's like he's waiting for me to post this, you know? <laughs> this man, he must have double notifications on. <laughs> yeah, you never know, right? Uh, okay, so he suggested three songs, but just for time saving, uh, we're going to do one. Uh, so we picked Was It You by AU5. Again, help us. How do we pronounce this? Is it Aus? AU5? Aus? <laughs> I have no idea. I have no clue. You know, I do. What I do know is how good this song sounded, you know, from the production to the vocals to just the whole progression of the song and the way it was structured. It was really, really enjoyable. Um, you know, you guys are really getting me more into that sort of uh, electro pop EDM kind of sound, man. I got to tell you, because the more I hear, I think it's just like, I don't think to put it on, but uh, you know, the more I hear, the more I like it. So this, this has a good rating for me. Yeah. And like AUR, he, he wrote here, you know, probably the cleanest mix song I've heard in my whole life. Yeah, uh, man, the mix. With, I felt like she was in the room. <laughs> with standards that are beyond professional mixing. What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what wow. that means. That's a compliment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, I, I really like this song. Um, it's a banger, I called it. You know, whenever I hear these type of things, I call it a banger. That's um, right. Sounds great. Like he said, it's mixed well. No complaints. I like this kind of music. Uh, you know, I just like I like uh, Dead Mouse, that kind of stuff, you know. And I sort of this one, I sort of, this is how I got introduced to this genre was, it used to be called trance music. And that really got me into it because it was very like, epic sounding you know but with like faster beats and stuff anyways i don't even know how to, i won't even attempt to describe what trance is so that's why when, whenever aur tells me this is future bass or future garage or whatever genre he thinks I, for me it's like it sounds like trance to me so aur let it, let me know if i'm right is it trance music or is this or am i totally off the map here <laughs> Let us know in the comments, our friend. And uh, thank you again for, for the suggestion. We appreciate your continued support, uh, AUR. Yeah. So now moving on to our friend Anton, who here uh, very kindly asked us to pronounce his last name. And you won't get upset if we butcher it, you know. But uh, I realized the fonts here are so small and my old eyes have a hard time seeing it. But when you copy paste this into a normal document and it's bigger, it's Vituslavsky. So I hope <laughs> I pronounced that right and didn't butcher Vituslavsky. it. Vituslavsky. I like the sound of that. Nice ring to I it. I love it. Eh? It's like an awesome exercise for the mouth, right? Vituslavsky. You know, anyway, That's right. <laughs> I love that kind of stuff. Yeah. So thank you again for suggesting. And he suggested Hanging Upside Down by Mekdis or Mekdis. Not sure how to pronounce now, that. This song was really cool for me. You know, this was like, 
I wasn't sure exactly what type of music it was going to be when it first kicked in. Also, usually I'm not crazy about those sort of laid back guitar melody beats anymore because I feel like it's been played out. But this somehow I found had a unique take on it. I, I kind of like the way the song went. And I would say pleasantly surprised would be my reaction for this song. Yeah, I had never um, heard of this artist again, as usual. Like this is, seems to be like my mantra right now. I've never heard of this artist. But anyway, yeah, that's why I love this this whole segment of the show. Right. I learned so much. Uh, I enjoyed this as well. And, I, you know, like. The production is stellar, literally, as I put here. And of course, I'm such a vocals guy. I love the vocals and especially the harmony vocals. It was a nice, fresh approach to the whole thing. No, 100%. So shout out to our guy, Anton Wituslavsky Kjeldzden. I even tried the last name for you, man. So there you go. He I said he say, won't be mad. He wouldn't be mad. Yeah, yeah, he wouldn't be mad. But I think it's Wituslavsky. And I, I think it's Kjelsen. I'm not Kjelsen. sure. Okay. Kjelsen. 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 I'm not Kjelsen. sure. Because I, because, you know, there was like some fam- similar hockey player names back in the day growing up. So I remember like, it's. I think it sounds like that. Anyways, moving on to our friend, our other friend here who suggested, I'd like to rec- recommend Baker Matt, which of course, again, never heard of them or him or <laughs> them. <laughs> What'd you think of this one? He suggested learn to lose and ain't nobody. I really like the video, first of all, like whatever, huh. whoever's doing these visuals, I think is is like definitely the champ. Um, you know, what I really had for this one was there was just generally good sort of pop. It it sort of just was it felt like easy listening to me. You just sort of nod your head and that snap in the background I liked. So listen, shout out to Baker, Matt. Um, it was yeah. unique, really, in all angles. This is something like uh, I'm going to, you know, definitely dive into uh, more uh, of the of the catalog, but um both songs great songs great production i love the video i love the fact that they they it's the same style for both songs and other videos that they have so it's like it's their you know brand i guess and what really took me from what these guys do their approach is that these it's a good example of indie pop right i think uh, but blended with edm sort of Textures, I guess, and sort of production techniques, you know, so it's a, a yes. really nice marriage of both worlds, you know, like, uh, like both benefited each other. N- like, it's not like the EDM took away from what could have been a, a fully indie pop song and vice versa, you know, so I think there's a really good marriage of, of both genres, you know. So thanks again for uh, suggesting that here. Always a good, always a great suggestion from you. Uh, let's check the next one. KC, is that someone new? KC, chain to the bottom of the ocean. Is the mm. band suffering yes. is a gift from God? <laughs> oh, tell us how you really feel. You know, I, I think I think they did in this song. You know, I like the expression, but this is too much screaming for me. I'm just gonna just be flat out about yeah. it. Yeah. It was, you know, there's a certain threshold of screaming vocals that I enjoy, and I think it's like a very fine line between what I can and can't listen to. So this just personally wasn't for me, but still well done. I thought the same thing, like for me, like the vocals uh, is what sort of turned me off to it. But the rest I kind of enjoyed. I like the sludginess, the heaviness, almost stoner kind of rock. But like, I don't want to insult if that's not what you were intending, but just like as an example. And even Brian has some Devin Townsend kind of stuff, not in terms of the musical, but more of like the vocals and the long screaming kind of thing. So same thing for me. It was like, I enjoyed it, but like, I'm not going to listen to it again or, or for a long periods of time because of the vocals. Like every once in a while, I can appreciate these type of vocals, but in general, the whole way through, I don't know how, how far, I'd, how many songs I'd make it into an album, you know? Yeah, I would completely agree. But again, like I like the aggression and this is the kind of thing I could see like at a live show could be really nice. Um, the yeah. next song sort of went with the same type of theme. This for me though, was a lot more unexpected. I did not expect this to be a screaming song when it first started. Same here. Uh, Colin <laughs> Olibson, he uh, suggested Between the Buried and Me and uh, the Extremophile Elite Live, the live version. Same here, dude. Like when I pressed play and I'm like, oh, okay, nice, nice, nice studio, you know? Uh, and like, again, the first thing that threw me off, I had no expectations of screaming vocals. I've heard of Between the Buried and Me for a long time and I was expecting sort of that kind those type of vocals but because it started off with this nice synth right exactly it started to go all over the place i did not expect that either you know so it did throw me off but i quite enjoyed it i enjoyed the the performance uh let me see if i have what my notes are here um yes yeah, so like i said i was in, so instantly surprised from the first note it was really nice 
Uh, vocals aren't my cup of tea, that's for sure. Uh, the interesting is, um, for me, was like the fact that a screaming band is using synths. Again, marriage of genres. No one's like staying away from synths because it's not metal enough, you know? Uh, exactly. Sick players, that's for sure, right? Like awesome players. Uh, and then I, I like the orchestral version uh, section, not version they had at around 4:30 ish. It was a uh, it was a cool uh, cool uh, surprise, but like overall, killer performance live on the spot, man, really good. Yeah, hundred percent. Especially, I think the live element was probably the most impressive for me. So, so I'm definitely well, taking that. I, I'm shocked. I'm not shocked because like I expect that from these type of musicians, artists, and bands. That's what I've come. I grew up in that stuff, so I know that you could play your instrument. You know what I mean? Like I go to a show knowing that. What I hear on the album, okay, it's going to sound different live, but it shouldn't be miles off. You know what I mean? It shouldn't be like you're shredding and super per precise, but then you're playing like a complete drunk and you're all over the place. It doesn't make sense, right? So I, I, I'm not surprised that they can play and that they show that they can play, but I was surprised, like you said, like when the keyboards come in and all of a sudden it's like, Rah! that yeah. sort of, uh, for a little bit of a spin. Um, Red Warrior Studios. Old school Dio, Sacred Heart, live again. You guys love your live versions, man. Yes, always live. For me, it's always a reverse. I never listen to a live because I've always been let down a lot of times, especially in this era. This is a, an amazing live performance, right? And even the yeah. record is really good. It's insane. I mean, Dio, you know, I would say probably one of the best live metal singers that there ever could be. Like, you take a Dio track from in the studio and you listen to him live on an isolated track and it's almost identical, you know? So that was one of the beautiful yeah. things about him. And, you know, I think uh, anytime I get to hear Dio sing, I feel like it's like a privilege. So, <laughs> I mean, this was really good. I didn't, I didn't see uh, this live version before, but uh, I, I was kind of scratching my head wondering how I missed this one. Yeah. I was impressed. Cause I mean, obviously I knew of Dio and all that stuff. I'm not, it's not my favorite black Sabbath singer. I, I still prefer Ozzy. Not that yeah, I don't like what he did. I, I love what he did. Um, but I, you know, it was just like, well, at the time Dio was sort of like, it was cool, but at the same time I didn't give it too, too much attention. But anyways, this live performance, man, his vocals, like you said, are spot on. Yeah. And you usually don't get that in the era, you know, back then, you know, like they're always a bit iffy or whatever. Uh, I, for, for, for a while, I was confused because I thought it was J.K. Lee on guitar. And I'm like, but wait, J.K. Oh. Lee played Ozzy, but it's Vivian <laughs> Campbell. And like Vivian Campbell, as we, I, I think you know, like I moved on and went on to Def Leppard for like since the 90s and a great guitar player, like super underrated. Wasn't underrated back then because everybody sort of had to have a, a guitar slinger, right? Ozzy got Randy, Van Halen. So you had to have like that. It was like the front man and the, and the guitar player back in the day. You know, that was like the, the important stuff. But yeah, thank Dynamic you for the question. Yeah, this was great. Uh, GameX Simmons, the Flatliners, I'll hurt or it'll hurt. What do you oh, think? Of yes, this? shout out to GameX Simmons, by the way, always coming in with with a lot of good different suggestions. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this to me was definitely interesting. I sort of felt hurt just listening to it, and nothing even happened <laughs> to me. No, I'm just joking. Uh, but honestly, I could feel the passion. I think it was. It almost reminded me kind of like the vocal style of those bands that you would hear on the East Coast. You ever heard like Great Big C? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I almost heard that type of vocal style with the straining on the voice. It's, um, funny. it's funny that you said that because like I thought it was like a 90s song when it started playing, but it's actually a 2022 release. And like going back to what you're saying about the, the vocals, uh, I got I wrote it down here. Singer has an Alice Cooper vibe. Oh, I could totally hear that. Okay. Yeah. Like you're, the straining that uh, part yeah. of it, you know, like I'm, right away I thought of Alice Cooper, you know? No, you're totally right. I could hear a little bit of that that inflection in his voice, you know, and yeah. it's cool that that style is actually still, you know, managing to continue when you think about it. Because, I mean, like, you know, God, when you talk about the godfathers of rock, Alice Cooper, one of the first people I mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, this, I like that song. I have no issues here. It was cool. Those are just my observations that I, you know, I noticed it sounded like Cooper and stuff. Uh, thanks again, GameX Simmons. Um, Mud. Korfgen, <laughs> the warning error. Oh, the warning. Now, I do have to say, guys, that I actually, Joe and I were just talking about the warning because I did get the chance to see this group live a couple weeks back. Uh, they were opening for Three Days Grace with the Standstills, who, of course, have been here on Inner Sleeve. Yeah. And uh, it was really cool. So the warning, a three-person band from Mexico. They're all sisters, biological okay. sisters, young women. <laughs> And they're one of the most kick-ass three pieces I've ever seen live, Joe. I mean, they they really 
they had something to prove. They came out and proved it. And uh, I mean, what was your first take of this, Ben? So this is the first time I've, I think I've heard of the warning. Like we spoke about them and stuff. I had never really listened to it. Um, and I thought it felt okay. felt good. Nothing really caught me as like, wow, you know, it felt a bit, uh, just a bit under, like the production could have been a bit more edgy. It was missing something like a little bit more on edge. I don't know what that means. It probably means nothing. You know, what does an <laughs> edge mean? Right. But I don't know. It was just missing something to really make it like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> That's the yeah. best example I can give. But I think, you know, they're all on their way and they're doing very well. And, uh, you know, like three sisters playing metal, man. Hey, that's a good day anyway, right? Exactly. I mean, I thought it was so cool and it was so awesome to see. And I also love the fact that they didn't use that card because, again, as an opening act, you're mostly in front of new audiences. They didn't use that card to win the audience over until the end. So I was like, I kind of respect that. You know, they're not trying to sell gimmicks. They're trying to sell their merit, which I think was very cool. So what was our last one that we had here, Joe? Yeah, not Donald Fagan. Kubik or Cubic and Cubonics. <laughs> yes. Now, I got to tell you this. This track here, I mean, the second I put it on, I had one word in my head, Joe, and it was outcast. That was literally all I could hear. Andre 3000, outcast, yeah. the instrumental, um, the voice. I could really hear that type of influence. And this really had that 90s classic sort of yeah. flair to it. Yeah, that's exactly what I listened to two tracks to get more of a vibe on it. Um, you know, I don't really have an opinion, but it's like, I know what you mean. Exactly. I, Cause you know, I was going to write, Ooh, good old school hip hop or rap. And like, what is, that doesn't say much. I would say that almost every week, <laughs> but yes, it was good. Like from what I heard, I really enjoyed it. Uh, is he, I don't know. Have you ever heard of cubic? I had not heard of him, but uh, it looks like he has a lot of work from what I could see online. I was curious to see like who, where he came from. Uh, this album, see, you were pretty damn close because it came out in 2000, right? Uh, and you were saying the 90s, and he is based out of a rapper from Fresno, California. So yeah, definitely like, uh, you know, like perfect for that time. That's pretty much what was coming out all around those days. You know, those days. I got my English is all over the place, but you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, perfect for the time, but I never heard of him before. Shout out to Cubic and shout out to everybody out there in the in the uh, comments for sending us all these different suggestions. We really appreciate it. Make sure to stay subscribed to Sound Mojo on YouTube, on the comms tab where you can find all of these posts. And maybe we'll be listening to your music and shouting you out next. So now we're going to hop into the guest portion of today's program. As mentioned off the top, it was a pleasure to be joined by Michael Gabriel on today's episode of the show. So much awesome content to discuss, guys. And again, if you're a fan of Prince, Sheila E., or anything to do with that whole universe, this is the episode for you. I cannot stress that enough. Yeah, if you also like one of those guys who likes to play and can play everything and play everything and record and mix and master all <laughs> well by yourself, this is uh, definitely someone to watch as well. Enjoy the episode. We'll catch you guys right afterwards. Michael Gabriel, welcome to the Inner Sleeve Music Podcast. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Awesome. Definitely, my man. Thank you for taking the time. So, I mean, uh, I like the background, by the way. You got like the, the energy, you got you know, the fireworks I, going. I got to <laughs> set the mood, you know, it's all about the mood. It's about the energy, the vibe, you know, you got to set the vibe. That's what it's about. <laughs> it's That's okay. a fact, man. So tell us what's been going on lately. Of course, you got new singles. You got the new record. Yeah, man. It's it's more of one of those things like what's not going on. That's kind That's of it. how I more look at it. It's <laughs> like what's name. not happening. I know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no. So I, I got a single out. It's called Let There Be Light. You know, uh, before that, I put out a single off my new record, uh, Genesis. Uh, that single Celebrate. Both of those, you know, are on the all streaming platforms. The album was released like a month ago. That's doing great. Um, I'm on tour with Sheila E. Um, I'm her lead guitarist. Uh, so we're always going here and there. Uh, we did a European tour uh, a couple weeks ago, and I, I actually just got back from a gig in South Carolina uh, yesterday. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, wow. I just wanted to let you know he's busier than us. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Maybe a little bit. Because <laughs> we're always saying, oh, my God, we're also busy running around here. No, no, you take the cake, man. <laughs> That's nah, the thing. Yeah. Just just trying to trying to do something, right? Make, what, make some waves. <laughs> what's it like uh, touring and playing with Sheila E? Oh, man, it's it's great. Um, I've been I've been working with her uh, for a long time. 
uh, since I was 16, actually, uh, touring with her for the last, uh, what, what is that? Like 11 years. Wow. Um, it's always an adventure, you know, yeah. there, it's always, it's something I never get tired of, um, because there's always an element of spontaneity and surprise, uh, when it comes to a Sheila E show and <clears throat> with her, you feel so encouraged to try to match her energy because she is just so she's up here from the from the top of show and yeah. um it's exhausting <laughs> but it's exhilarating at the same time how long is the show like 90 minutes yeah about 90 minutes sometimes two yeah. hours you know um but it's yeah it's uh it's, i mean it's if you haven't come to a sheely show you got it you got to make sure you do it in your lifetime i'll just say that yeah yeah, I just like I, I stumbled on one of your YouTube shorts that you posted not too long ago of a jam like of you on stage with them. And I was like, wow, every night must be fire. Literally, like th that's the word that came to my head. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny as it's, it's, it's many times as we play the show and we do mix it up a lot, you know, so that kind of that's another sort of elements like you're always as a musician, especially you're having to kind of stay on your toes. You can never get too relaxed and each member in the band will say this for sure it's like it's not it's nothing you can really kind of sleep on or skate through you know sort of thing <laughs> it's like when you're when you're doing that gig it's kind of all hands on deck and you have to be you know you have to be in it and committed awesome what was your first exposure to sheila e maybe taking it back was it it must have been oh. before 16. Woo! yeah so that's uh yeah so that's kind of going into going into my background so um, just really quickly, um, my connection, my connection to Sheila happened before I was even born. Mm. Sheila's actually my godmother. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, my parents, they met on the purple rain world tour. Uh, my dad, Gilbert Davison, uh, was uh, Prince's personal security and then, uh, manager and, uh, president of Paisley park, uh, eventually. And then my mom, Constance was Sheila's uh, road manager and co-lyricist um, and their childhood friends. They, they grew up in the Bay Area together. Um, so Sheila is my godmother. And I, I say jokingly, you know, I'm kind of a product of this Purple Rain World Tour. Like had that not happened, right. I would not even be here today. <laughs> you know, that's insane to think of. I mean, how, how does that feel for you as such a musical person who's obviously been impacted by that stuff? Well, I'm so grateful for it now. Um, but at the time, and you got to remember, you know, at the time as a, as a young child, I'm looking at everything through a child's eyes. Right. And yeah. so some of those unique experiences that I had, I didn't realize were abnormal. I didn't realize that they were unique. And it wasn't until I got a little bit older that I was able to appreciate the true uniqueness of the situation. Um, and so now I'm filled with nothing, you know, but gratitude for all of the, you know, weird, interesting, crazy, unique um, blessings that I've been able to experience in my life and my career. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of my answer in a nutshell. I'm assuming what would like, you, go ahead, sorry, Joe. I was just going to jump in. Like, I was, like your dad being so close to Prince and, and the whole, that whole scene at that time. Right. So, I mean, obviously that influenced you to play was to play instruments and play music, right? No? Huge, huge, oh, impact. Okay. <laughs> huge, huge impact. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that, and that's kind of like part of the uniqueness that I'm talking about, you know, mm. Prince would come to the house. We would, you know, I'd visit Paisley, you know, we'd go to a show or something like that, but it's, you know, it's all through the eyes of a child. And, and it wasn't until I was older that, you know, I, as a kid, you're, you're kind of like a sponge, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, I'm able to make these connections. Like that's, that's a huge reason I have such a passionate and strong love and connection for music is because of those experiences, you know, and all those things that were happening around me and all the things I absorbed kind of as a child. How would you describe the concerts back then as a child, like through a child's eyes? Was it something like were the actual events something that you realized the scale of super like, it was supernatural you know to, I, right. in a way i kind of it was kind of like um like superhero like comic books like almost like real but fantasy you know at the same yeah. time um normal a bit too but not normal you're right yeah you know, i so for me like the sign of the times concert 
that was like that VHS tape was just like always on in my house. And so I would be, you know, rehearsing and kind of mimicking what I was seeing on screen, you know, with my plastic guitar playing it upside down backwards, running around, you know, in the living room. <laughs> and, you know, that just expanded from there, you know, from the time I was very, very young to, you know, getting more serious and taking music lessons and uh, learning how to play guitar for real. And, you know, my parents were always really supportive. There, you know, was instruments of every type in the house growing up. Um, and so they just really kind of fostered and encouraged um, just my exposure and um, um, opportunity to kind of express myself in a musical way from a very early age. And that's why you do you play a lot of instruments as well, right? Yeah. I, so like everything on the record, for example, everything I everything on Genesis, everything you hear is played by me and just wow. just me. Um, and some of that is done kind of selfishly and out of necessity in the moment, um, because when you're being creative, um, you guys probably know this, you know, when you're being creative, you sometimes you just want to get the idea out. Yeah. You know, yeah. you just you just want to put it out. You don't have time to wait. You don't have time to calculate. You don't have time to call this person and say, hey, you know, can you can you plan it and send me back, send it back to me or, you know, hey, let's book studio time. It's like I'm in the studio now. This is how I hear it. I just need to capture that out. moment. I just need to capture the moment capture you because you're capture. It's truly capturing a moment. You're not just capturing, you know, uh, an, an arrangement. You're not just capturing chords or notes or whatever. It's really, you know, a form of expression of what you're feeling right there in that time. And sometimes I feel like even if you were to play sort of the same thing when you weren't like in that zone and you weren't feeling it, it's going to sound different. Absolutely. You know? That lightning yeah. in a bottle feeling, right? It's hard right. to hard to really capture. So what exactly. were the first instruments that you really gravitated towards and, and what were you, did you find oh, yourself playing first? It was, I mean, it was guitar for sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. Electric? Yeah. Well, actually, no. Um, so my, <laughs> my parents, uh, they, they wanted uh, me to take uh, classical, like Suzuki style, nylon okay. string, you know, uh, uh, lessons. But they just said, we're getting you guitar lesson, lessons. And I was like, oh, great. That's awesome. But I I didn't understand the differentiation at the time, you know. Mm -hmm. So you know, I was growing up listening to you know Prince and Jimi Hendrix, and and then I'm holding this nylon string, and I'm like, this is the <laughs> same thing. You're saying this is the same thing. This is how they got those sounds that I'm hearing on those <laughs> records. Okay, if that's what you're saying, you know, in my you know five five year old mind, you know, or whatever. And so we go to uh, my Suzuki lesson. And down the hall, I hear the sounds echoing of an electric guitar. Mm. And my eyes just do this. <laughs> Let me go to that and, room. <laughs> yeah. And, and my dad, he looked at me. He's like, you want to learn how to play like that? Too? And I just go. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> and so that that was that was kind of the, the beginning of that, you know, sort of transition to uh, electric guitar. Yeah. yeah, like in classic 80s, you know, I want to rock. Right? Yeah, like you're like, yeah. Oh, rock. <laughs> right. Yeah. The whole whole rock star vibe. Yeah. I, I think there's like something about it. Like even myself, like I started, they taught me acoustic first. I learned like Beatles, Elvis songs. Right. And like, you know, once you can get acoustic, electric is way easier in terms of like on your hands, you know, but. Right. Even in, in terms of the, a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot yeah, of times exactly. in terms of the thickness of the neck. And that was going to be my even, next question. You know, like, scaling. is that true? Uh, a transition from acoustic to electric. Yeah. Um, there's just different. Um, sometimes it's just a different feel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some things that just you you can play on an electric that right. on an acoustic, it just, yeah, it just it doesn't work or vice versa. R r exactly. Exactly. And I and I feel like you know, it's just like anything in music in terms of instruments. I I think of instruments a lot of times in terms of tools. You know, and uh, one of my mentors, he would always say, you know, it's not the tool, it's the, it's the craftsman. Right. You know, and so I, right. I think a lot about that now, you know, and at the time, you know, there was just this excitement in my belly as a kid, you know, electric guitar was everything, um, you know, but now it's like, okay, uh, there's a lot of times I'll grab my acoustic as opposed to, you know, my electric when it fits, um, mm -hmm. you know, and vice versa. A lot, there's a lot of times I might gravitate to the piano versus the guitar for something. 
You know, it just all right. kind of depends on, you know, the emotion that you're trying to capture, the sentiment that you're trying to represent. So when you first started playing, were you really writing a lot of music as well? Or, or did the writing come in later? Like so, for, for songwriting? Right. Uh, so, so again, I, I keep kind of echoing back to things in my childhood, but that was one of the things I, I talked about a lot with my parents. But I, you know, I think it's something, you know, probably they heard from, you know, some other, you know, musical source, whether it be Sheila or Prince or something like that. But they they would always tell me if you can sing it, if you can hum it, you can play it. Wow. And hmm. and yeah. And so I got the I, same advice. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And and it's so true. It's like seems so simple, but there's something mm -hmm. that happens in your brain. Like when you truly understand it, you go, well, wait a second. A whole new just door of opportunities just opened for me. So when I realized that, um, I discovered that my true passion in music was for songwriting. So yeah, I've been I've been writing songs. You know, I can't even tell you how long I've been writing songs. I've probably been writing songs longer than I've been playing any instruments. I can tell you that wow. for sure. And, okay, you know, yeah, hundred percent. Right. Yeah, and so and, and that's kind of uh, you know kind of bringing it back to now. That's kind of what inspired th this record. I've I literally have hundreds of songs in my own sort of personal vault or whatever you want to call it catalog of songs without a home. And it was really important, especially kind of during the pandemic, like a lot of musicians and a lot of creatives and stuff like that. You know, you have all this time to think, right? And so I started thinking, I was like, I want to find a home for all of these songs, all of this work that I've been, you know, putting into my music. You know, it has to, there, it has to come into fruition in some form or fashion. I have to materialize it in some way. And so that's what inspired me to say, okay, I'm just going to sit down and, and do this record because, you know, I started working in this industry because of my passion for writing music. Um, but my career, you know, I've been doing a lot of things for other people. You know, I've been, I've yeah. worked with a lot of different artists, you know, I've been on, I've done tours, I've done all these different things. And so during the pandemic, I started thinking, I was like, you know what, I want to do this for me. You know, I've been, I got into this because of that passion for writing. So let me really dedicate some time to really doing it right. And so you know, that's that's kind of how this album kind of came to be. I've always thought of that, like uh, when you write, like myself too, I'll write and stuff, but like I write mostly for myself. But I always right. wondered that when you're writing and you share it, like how do you know or what song, what tells you that this song, oh, maybe I should share it for this person or maybe I should hit up this guy for this and not just say, oh, I'll keep it all to myself. Like, is there something that comes in your mind or something like you know i just i just started really thinking about it i don't know like maybe getting a little bit too much in my own head but just kind of thinking it's like you know why why does this even exist like why is this even because you could argue that you know talent is 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 rare you know and sometimes can be taken for granted right like I was writing a lot selfishly just because like I just I had something in my head I wanted to get out and wanted to wanted to hear for myself. Um, but then I started thinking, you know, like if I get this feeling hearing this music, maybe it's worth sharing with someone else. And even if it's like just one other person that's jazzed about hearing it, you know, maybe it's worth it. You know, sort of that whole idea is like if, you know, if we could just make somebody else's day just a little bit better by you know putting something positive out into the world you know we're we're making our difference making a difference in our own sort of my like micro way you know but it's all of those millions of little small tiny things that we all do in our lives that equate to the big thing you know we you know sometimes <clears throat> the pessimist can say you know it's like well it's not what am i going to do to really change the world and you know I'm, I tend to, I like to think of myself as a more of a glass half full type of thinker. And so again, not trying to get too much in my own head. I was like, you know what? I, I think it's time. I've, I've held on to these for long enough. Let me put them out there so that they can kind of belong to somebody else for a change. Wow. I mean, it's true. It, it's kind of like, you know, the, the small steps, it, it may not seem like you're, you're necessarily getting there all at once, but it's like, if you go to the gym one day and, and lift weights, you're not going to see results when you go home. Right. So it's like after years of a, a right. cumulative effort, um, it's going to happen. So, so how it's about exactly the that? 
right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, how about the production process for this this record? Like, uh, in terms of mixing, mastering, how was that handled? And and where was most of the line share of this recorded? Uh, so it was all recorded in Minneapolis. All recorded, or I, I mostly recorded it in my personal studio. Um, and I, I'm an engineer by trade. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so I handled all the all the mixing, <laughs> mastering. Yeah. So I mean, I'm telling you, like, there was no excuse for me not to get it done. I came That's up with. It. You know, like I had years of excuses of, you know, I'm so busy. I got this going on, that going on, and you know, this project, that project, you know, but finally I said, okay, no more excuses. You just, you just got to do it. That's it. So, I mean, in terms of the mixing and mastering, have you ever gone to other people for your projects? Like, or do you like to just mix and master everything that, that you make? Uh, for, for, oh, so, um, for a few projects, um, like years ago, I had, um, some fellow colleagues that I would reach out to, cause sometimes it's nice to get like a second year on something. Yeah, um, yeah. and of course, you know, I have, I have a few colleagues that I'll even do that too with now on stuff that I'm working on. It's like, oh, Hey, you know, just kind of utilizing, um, other, you know, professionals, as a sounding board, it's like, Hey, what do you think of this? And just really give me some serious kind of critiques on, you know, how, where's my room for improvement? Um, I think that's good, you know, to be able to have those, uh, people in your, in your life or even professional or personal circle that you can trust and just kind of bounce some things off of. So there was some of that. Um, uh, now, uh, if, if it's not something that, that is my project, um, yeah, we have teams of people that I'm working with on, you know, various projects for other artists and whatnot, because, you know, sometimes it's just too much for one person. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's, it takes a team, you know, to, like they say it takes a village, you know, sometimes to, you know, put on these large scale things. Um, and then as far as uh, like music videos and uh, all the stuff that we do on uh, the visual aspect for, for my personal project. Um, we, you know, I have a team for that. You know, say when you start a song or you get the initial idea or you're, you know, you're working, do, do they come fast to you or do they, or, or like, I know sometimes it's some are fast, some are slow, but like in general, are, they, are you fast? Like your song's done or does it take you like, uh, I don't know, a week sometimes to finish a tune? Ooh. Uh, it, it all depends. It, it Mm -hmm. kind of all depends on that, like that X factor, you know, it's like, do you feel in the zone or not? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And if you're in the zone, like, uh, the song that's, uh, that's out right now, um, let there be light that was written in like 30 minutes. Yeah. That's what I was asking. I was like, yeah, sometimes it's like, you're just there at the right time at the right place to receive and it just comes right. right? Yeah. And engine engineering wise and mixing wise, you know, I can be a little bit kind of too professionist, like professionistic in my approach where it's like, oh, you know, I just want to tweet. And it's because like, you know what you, I don't know. So I've been trying uh, more recently. It's like uh, in my plugins folder, like on Pro Tools and whatnot. I'm just, I get rid of stuff that like I'm not using, you know, because it's, I feel like it's important. It adds up. It's like <laughs> it adds up. It's like you know, I've never used this plugin in my life. Like what? What is it doing here? Taking up space and you know, just because you see it in that plugin list, but it also takes up a form of like you know yeah. mental storage. You know, it's like yeah, yeah. you know, I'm just you know, I I trying to treat it more like an artist, right? It's like mm-hmm. here's my palette that I have to choose from, and here's what here's so I I know what I'm working with at any given instance and use use that and i feel like that's been uh, a better approach yeah I, t- I remember once i had like a gig to remix someone's album and I, I was in the middle of like tearing down and set up studio kind of thing so the plugins oh, are all over the place that's the worst <laughs> but then i said you know what i said i had like because i use cubase so like i was using cubase and then yeah. i'm like and rewire because rewire has you know it was old school stuff so i'm yep. like and I like, well, the weak, the limitations is going to be the strength of this album. And it, it was is. true. It ended it up being is. exactly that. Exactly. And then you feel better. You feel lighter. You know, you just, ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You feel better. You feel lighter. It, yeah. The limitation is, is actually a strength for sure. I agree with that a hundred percent. Yeah. 
cool. helps you kind of narrow down. It's like, what is the sound yeah. that I'm going after? Because like yeah. you've been there, right? You're going from oh look here this snare, this 808. Oh no, this 808. Oh, how's yep. this 808? Yep. <laughs> yeah, I know. I I I admire this. Um, but I and I don't know how true it is. I think I read in an article that Daft Punk on one of their records, like they spent like three three months or six months, some some extended period of time just listening to sounds. And I, it, in a way, I kind of admire that because like it, that sort of pre-production and whatnot what were they doing they were eliminating what they didn't want right mm -hmm. you know kind of narrow down their options kind of limiting themselves that it was like a poor a form of like pre-limiting your options you mm -hmm. know so like in a way you could say you know i guess maybe maybe they, ha they had that same philosophy they just kind of went about it in a different way yeah well i've always heard you i don't know if you're familiar with he passed away a few years ago mike shipley the mixer Yes, he's like you know the 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 Def Leppard and the Shania. Yep. He he was my Mutt Lang's uh, right hand guy, right? Yep. And I remember he was on a forum once, and he was saying that it they they had to do a Shania Twain song, and like they wanted to make sure that every syllable and vowel popped out of the mix. So they EQ'd yep. each syllable to make sure that it was never buried, yeah. and always perfect, and like probably took like three days or something like that. It was something yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah. I, sometimes insane. you can really get into that. <laughs> you can, you can, and so, and yeah, and I, I've been down that road too, especially like with with a lead vocal, you know, where you'll mm -hmm. kind of spot EQ, you know, syllables sometimes. Yeah, yeah, you know, you and stay it, on it, it all day. Yeah, you can stay exactly, you know, and so sometimes that's the challenge, you know. It's like okay, the technical mind meets the creative mind. They have to kind of there has to be a a, a marriage. Well, between the two you know yeah. that isn't that doesn't become too like time prohibitive or time costly mm -hmm. you know it has to make sense you know because well, you, like, you got to make both like the devil and the angel next to you both happy sort of you know or it's like right. i just want to get this done but at the same time no but i like to geek out on this you know because right you know five years down the line you're gonna listen to it you don't want to say i knew i should have fixed that right dude and that's happened to me i'm like yeah that's gonna bother and nobody else will hear it nobody else. You, you'll hear it and it'll bother yeah. you so you know <laughs> just just get it done so yeah the, the checklist help too you know just like True. okay little notes okay you know so. <laughs> how many different artists would you say that you work with at one time oh at one time uh at one at any given time you know sometimes it's like two or three um okay yeah that's still a lot it, though yeah it's like you know taking on too too much at one time it's like especially if you're trying to meet deadlines it's just you spread yourself too thin and when you do that like the quality can be l less than you know what you the standard of quality just kind of goes down the more projects you try to take on at one time you know i've done a lot of different things but at like at any given instance if you try to take on too much then I mean, you don't want the quality to le to be any less than you know yeah. what whatever your standard of quality should be, whatever you feel that it should yeah. be. You know, so mm -hmm. I feel like that's really really important. So I try not to take on way too much at any given time, where I like I have to make compromises in my standard of quality. No, that's awesome. a good way to put it. One hundred percent. Sorry, Joe. Were you gonna were you gonna jump no, in? No, I was just because I'm looking at the, the the press release and you've worked with some freaking heavy hitters, you know, like like and some like even just like just people did the names, you know, like George Duke, like what, you know, George Clinton, you know. Yeah. Uh, but then you know, Same. there's also like uh, you know Sh Sheila E, Stevie Wonder, anyway, Ringo Starr. But yeah. like I stopped at this one and I'm just curious as I wanted to know what you did with Hans Zimmer. Okay, so yeah, so those. <laughs> Those are always interesting because there's always just all of a sudden, and uh, some of them have been uh, been with and through kind of Sheila and her connection with Hans because she's done a lot of uh, drumming work yeah. on that, um, on like Wonder Woman, Superman, um, yeah. all the like the Madagascars and whatnot. So I can't remember all of the ones that we've done, but we've done a lot of uh, some of his animated scores and whatnot uh, for like Madagascar um there's been I, I have to forgive me because sometimes they don't even tell you what it is that it's for it ends <laughs> okay up on, yeah. yeah exactly yeah. you just know oh it was that, that film that he worked on that's what we were doing that's so yeah. awesome that's freaky that's freaky though. but his, yeah, it must his, be interesting to, to have that yeah his team is so um efficient he's just brilliant um i i admire his uh just process a lot and um um yeah it, it's just uh 
again, I just feel nothing but gratitude for, for being able to kind of work with him and his team. Yeah. Were you there like in those sessions? I know there was a uh, years ago, I was just like, I'm a, a Hans, uh, Hans Zimmer uh, like junkie, but there was a session where he had like, I think nine drummers. So I wasn't there for that, oh, but okay. I, I, yeah, Sheila gave me the play by play and I was like, crazy. that is, I think she called me to, to come in for that one, but I wasn't able to make it, but it was, uh, you know, cause the studio is like, uh, like a what do you like a spaceship or something like that you know what i mean like just all these different things on um on the on his wall you know um different um processors and you know different uh, pieces of retro gear and whatnot um so yeah but uh that session um she she is she always explains it as like a kind of a magical moment you know to have all those drummers in one place doing yeah i can't remember exactly every drummer i remember sheila jason bonham uh, mm -hmm. like wow. it was pretty crazy i was yeah. like wow yeah because yeah, they turn into like kind of one organism you know sort of yeah. thing so yeah really cool i know like hans you know like hans and uh uh not uh what's the name Tom holkenberg tom holkenberg junkie xl you know they mm -hmm. work together a lot and i know that the, like they have the they work on these movies and crazy uh soundtracks and stuff that like they make their own sample libraries so i think i'm yeah. pretty sure to you know that's, like, yeah that's what that's exactly what they do like they that's they it. catalog it all so every different sound every it's uh i mean that's a job in and of itself you know to yeah. you catalog all of that Cool. No doubt. Obviously here at Watch Mojo, we're well known for our top 10 lists and this episode is going to be no exception. So what we've done for you, Ooh. Michael, is pull the top 10 list uh, and we wanted to see if you could maybe anticipate what any of the top three in this list are going to be. Uh, so this one was the top 10 songs you didn't know were written by Prince. <laughs> and uh, so just off the top of your head, I don't know if there's any that you throw out, <laughs> want to throw out there that you know are typically not known. And if not, we can just Ooh. jump into the top three. Uh, that are typically not known. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna throw any in in, in the in the thing right now. <laughs> okay, so let's yeah. see if you know which ones ended up in the top three. So number three is Donald Trump by the time. I guess was actually written by Prince, which is not a song that I'm familiar with. Nope, no, me neither. I neither. I'd, I'd have to go for a second. That one up. I read it backwards. I was like, what? He wrote a song for Donald Trump. <laughs> oh, so, no. Yeah. It, uh, definitely not a song for time. Trump, but <laughs> yeah. for time. Number two was Manic Monday by the oh. Bangles. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember that's hearing a, about that. That's a classic. Yeah. That's a definitely known one. Okay. Okay. And number one, Nothing Compares to You. Oh, Sinead yeah. O'Connor. Oh, everybody yeah. knows that one. Everybody right? knows that one. Knew, yeah. 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 A little quick question before we go. I'm just curious, like, you know, in terms of that, you've been at Paisley Park and all that stuff. Like, this is. I, you know, because Cassius and I always talk about like Frank Zappa, the vault, how much stuff we haven't heard. And we know that like Prince has, must have a crazy vault in there as well. Have you ever been privy to hear some stuff that you're like, man, you know, like no one else has heard this? Um, Probably, probably while he was alive, um, mm. but not, not since. Um, but yeah, I know that. I mean, he was recording every day, you know, yeah. it was uh, music. It was what he lives for, you know, that's, and uh, that's his legacy. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, I know there's, you know, probably countless hours of material there. Um, mm. So, you know, we'll see what happens in the future in terms of what we get to be able to hear. But, you know, I think it's a thing, whatever it is that we're able to hear and uncover, we'll, you know, it's, it's kind of a little blessing, you know? Yeah. Anything's a bonus, right? A hundred percent. The brand new album Genesis is available everywhere now. Michael Gabriel, thank you so much for your time, my man. We, we really appreciate oh. you uh, stopping by to chat with us. Thank awesome. you so much for having me, guys. Huge shout out to Michael Gabriel for joining us on episode number 102 of the Inner Sleeve Music Podcast. Hopefully this conversation did not disappoint. It definitely didn't disappoint me as a personal fan of Prince and, you know, of course, Sheila E. Hearing the stories he told, you know, of growing up and being around Paisley Palace, being around these legends. Yeah. It's really hard to put yourself in his shoes. I mean, at least it is in my mind. Man, I can I still have crystal clear memories of when I was nine, 10, 
eight, getting into Molly Crew, getting listening to the you know um, in my dad's car all the time because we had an eight track in the car, and I happened to have Sergeant Pepper's and just like listening to it all the time, whenever you know like, and just absorbing this stuff. So can you imagine like that same experience, but yet it's with Prince on tour live, <laughs> Sheila E at the studio. Holy cow, because I was then listening to Prince and this guy was, you know, growing up with it. You know, it's, it's incredible. What an opportunity. It is incredible. And it was great to chat with him as well. So we want to thank our guy, Michael, for taking the time. And we want to thank each and every one of you out there in the audience for tuning into this brand new episode of the Inner Sleeve Music Podcast. We're out every single week with a brand new episode. So make sure to come check us out. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube. We're on socials as well at Sound Mojo. So make sure to go show us some love on all of our social platforms. That's TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We'll respond. We'll retweet. We'll do whatever you guys want us to do. Uh, and of course, be interacting in the community tab as well, right on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for checking into this brand new episode of the Inner Sleeve Music Podcast. We'll catch you guys next week. Bye.